Hello everyone, welcome to my video tutorial on AWS Storage Services. Before I start my tutorial, I'm a blogger and I write my blog at techieandtravel.com. Do check it out. Also, if you want the AWS certification course or if you are a beginner to advanced level, you can check out my other AWS contents in my YouTube channel. So let's start today's tutorial. Let's look at the overview. We'll talk about cloud storage types and then we'll talk about Amazon Elastic File System, Amazon Elastic Block Store, and we'll mostly focus on the Amazon S3. We'll talk about data transfer with AWS Snowball and AWS Snowmobile, and we'll also talk about the archiving storage classes called S3 Glacier. So let's look at the cloud storage types. Primarily, there are three storage solutions provided by the cloud provider. They are file storage, block storage and object storage. Let's look at the file storage first. In file storage, storage is presented as a file system that is optimized for serving files with large number of network connections. So here, data is stored as a single piece of information inside a folder. So when you need to access that piece of data, your computer needs to know the path to find it. And the user or application receives the data through the directory trees, folder, and individual files. It is analogous to the network attached storage or NAS. Enterprises, they use NAS to store files that are shared by multiple systems. And NFS protocol is used for accessing the files that are stored in NAS share. Amazon Elastic File System or EFS is the AWS service for storing and sharing files in the cloud based on file storage. EFS can be mounted on multiple servers at the same time for sharing files. And it can also be mounted to on-premise servers over the VPN or Direct Connect. It's a network file system for Linux-based workloads. Let's look into the Elastic File System in brief. It is a fully managed NFS file system and it's especially for Linux workloads and it supports up to petabyte scale of data. And EFS, it is replicated across multiple availability zones within the AWS region. It provides two different storage classes called standard and infrequent access. So the standard is the one that you access frequently and infrequent access as the name suggests is for storing the data that you want access frequently. And it provides configurable lifecycle data rules. So the lifecycle configuration is basically a set of rules that defines the actions that are applied to the data that is stored in the file system. We'll talk about multiple lifecycle configuration in a bit. So the file storage only operates with the common file level protocols like a new technology file system called NTFS for Windows or a network file system or NFS for Linux. Let's say we have these two EC2 instances in two different availability zones, availability zone A and availability zone B. In this case, we can have an elastic file system that is working across both the availability zones. And EFS has an ability to be a network file system where you can attach these to the multiple instances at the same time. Now, if you are running Windows workload on Amazon Web Service, then there is another option called Amazon FSX for Windows File Server. This is a fully native Windows file system is opposed to the Linux file system that we saw with EFS. And it includes native Windows feature support like SMB support, Active Directory integration, and Windows NTFS. And it also utilizes SSD drives for low latency. Next, we'll talk about block storage. So block storage breaks up data into smaller chunks called blocks, and then stores those blocks as a separate pieces, each with unique identifier. And these blocks or data, they can be accessed by application using the memory address of the block. This is analogous to the storage area network. So enterprises, they use SAN technology as a block storage and those could be attached to the servers. And to the servers, it appears as if the volume is running locally. So the servers, they get access to these dedicated SAN logical units or also called LUNs which are the virtual hard disk, and they are not shared among the servers, unlike in Elastic File System. So EBS is a Amazon service for block store in the cloud, and EBS is used as a disk volume when EC2 instance is provisioned by default. 
block store this allows data to be spread across multiple environments and this creates multiple paths to the data and it allows the user to retrieve this data quickly so let's say when a user or application requests the data from the block storage system the underlying storage system reassembles the data blocks and presents the data to the user or application so let's discuss about the elastic block store in detail so on a high level EBS is a block storage which is designed to be connected to the single EC2 instance. So in EBS, we have a single volume that is attached to the each instances. And it enables redundancy within an availability zone. So this provides the durability that is required. It allows user to take snapshots of its data. So if you have a block device that is attached to the EC2 instance, but you want to periodically take the backups of this data, then EBS provides that facility for you. It also supports encryption, but this is not enabled by default and you have to manually configure it. It also provides multiple volume types, including the general purpose SSDs, provisioned IOPS SSDs, uh, throughput optimized hard disk drives and cold hard disk drives. So let's look at these volume types. So the first EBS volume type is a general purpose SSD. And this is a cost effective type that is designed for the general workloads. And this is the default disk type that is attached to the EC2 instance. But if you have, let's say more intense workloads, then you might want to have the provisioned IOPS SSDs. This is a high performance volume and has low latency. And then you have throughput optimized hard disk drives that is designed for frequently accessed data. But you might have situations where you have less frequently accessed data. In those situations, you may consider using the cold hard disk drive volume type. Next, let's look at one of the important storage types called object storage. In object storage, data is broken into discrete units called objects and they are kept in a single repository. It is a key value storage in which objects are stored as a single entity, unlike the files in folders as we saw in EFS or as a blocks on servers that we saw with block storage types. So each object receives a unique ID and applications use this unique ID to identify the object and each object stores metadata information about the files stored in the object. And any update to the object requires replacing the full object with the new version. So there is a concept of versioning with the object stored in S3. Object storage is not suitable for hosting the operating system or for running databases, but it can be used for storing the backup or some snapshot volumes of the disks, etc. Simple storage service or S3 as it is called is the Amazon service for storing the objects in the cloud. The objects, they are accessed via HTTP protocol using the RESTful API that allows application to create, update, copy and delete the objects in the buckets or container. So the buckets or container are where the objects are stored. So here mainly we'll discuss about S3 and its capabilities because it's one of the core services of AWS. So Amazon S3, it lets you to store file as objects in buckets and buckets are the unit of organization in S3. So you will go ahead and create a bucket and it will have some fixed settings. Then any file you put in the S3 bucket have those settings applied to it. The file range can vary from zero byte to five terabyte, but it has unlimited storage, meaning that you can store the data as much as you want. S3 is a global service. That is, it's not limited to one specific region like other AWS services. So the bucket name where you store the object, it must be unique. S3 is object based and object consists of key, which is simply the name of the object, a value, which is actually the data inside the file, and version ID, which uniquely identifies each object, and metadata, which is the information about the data that you are storing in S3, and sub-resources, which is a mechanism that is used to store object-specific information. And it can also have access control information, which uh, you can put the permission individually on your files. So now let's talk about the AWS storage class. The first one is, S3 standard. 
So S3 standard storage class stores the data redundantly across multiple devices in multiple facilities. It is designed to sustain the loss of two facilities concurrently and it is a default storage class if you don't specify anything during the upload and it provides low latency and high throughput performance. It is designed for 99.99% availability and 99.99 durability. Next, we have standard infrequent access. So as the name suggests, it's used when the data is accessed less frequently, but requires rapid access. And it has lower fee than S3, but you will be charged for a retrieval fee. It is designed to sustain the loss of two facilities concurrently. It is mainly used for larger objects which are greater than 128 kilobyte and they are kept for at least 30 days. It provides low latency and high throughput performance and it is also designed for the same availability percentage and durability percentage as standard S3. So the next one we have is one zone infrequent access. S3 one zone infrequent access storage class is used when data is accessed less frequently. But it stores the data in a single availability zone while the other two storage classes they store data in minimum of three availability zone so because of this reason its cost is 20 percent less than the standard ia storage class but the problem is the data can be lost at the time of destruction of an availability zone because it only stores in a single availability zone this is an optimal choice for less frequently accessed data but it does not require the availability of standard or standard IA storage class and it is good for storing the backup data. It also provides the lifecycle management for automatic migration of objects to other storage classes and we'll talk about this in a bit but this is mainly used for cost optimization. Next we have archival storage called S3 Glacier. S3 Glacier storage class is the cheapest storage class but it can be used for archive only. You can store any amount of data at a lower cost than other storage classes. You can upload objects directly to the S3 Glacier and it's designed for 99.99% durability of objects across multiple availability zones. And S3 Glacier provides three different type of models. Expedited, which is the model in which data is stored for a few minutes and it has very higher fee. And the other one is standard where the retrieval time of the standard model is for three to five hours. And then the bulk where the retrieval time of bulk model is five to 12 hours. And in S3 Glacier, data is stored in more than three availability zones. Then you have another category of storage class called intelligent tiering. Intelligent tiering is the only way where you can automatically move data between different storage classes based on their access. It has two different storage class associated with it which is frequent and infrequent. For a small monthly monitoring and automation fee per object, this intelligent tiering, it monitors the access patterns of the objects that you store in S3 and move those objects that have not been accessed for 30 consecutive days to the infrequent access tier. So when you move your data back and forth between these two different classes, it gives you pretty much the same performance as what you get with the standard S3, but it can provide cost savings if you want some data that needs to be moved between the different storage classes. And there are no retrieval fee in S3 intelligent tiering. If an object in infrequent access tier is accessed later, then it is automatically moved back to the frequent access tier. Next, we'll talk about the lifecycle management. Lifecycle management is used so that the objects are stored cost effectively throughout their cycle. A lifecycle configuration is a set of rules that defines the actions that are applied by S3 to this group of objects. Lifecycle defines two different types of actions, transition actions and expiration actions. Transition, it enables objects to move from one storage class to other based on time. Lifecycle allows you to transition objects to standard infrequent access storage class automatically 30 days after you have created them. And then 60 days after you have created them, it moves to the Glacier storage class. But note that you cannot move something back and forth based on the usage though. The usage movement is only available with the intelligent hearing. The expiration actions can delete objects based on age. 
So on expiration action, it supports versioning of data. And you could say something like uh, delete a version of file that is not current version after seven days. So in summary, business, it generates a lot of data in form of test files or images, audios, videos, and those data might be relevant for a few days. For instance, if those data are not used after 30 days, you might want to transition them to the standard infrequent access as the storage cost is lower than the S3 standard. And then if it's still unused for, let's say 60 days, you might want to transit them to the Glacier storage class, which is for long-term archival. So perhaps you also want to expire those objects after 60 days completely so that Amazon has this service known as lifecycle management where you can manage the lifecycle of the objects that you store in S3 bucket and it helps you to optimize the cost. Next, we'll talk about how to get these large data into AWS cloud. And even if you don't want to upload your data over the public internet, you have various ways to do this. So let's look into the AWS large scale data transfer services. The first transfer service is AWS Snowball. So this is a service to physically migrate petabyte scale of data to AWS. So it's a physical device that is delivered by AWS to your location. And you can connect these to your network and upload the data from within your network. So when you are done, you return it. And when you return it, it's going to be returned by a local carrier back to the Amazon Web Services. AWS will receive this device and it will load your data to S3. But if you feel that you have more than petabyte scale of data and this is not sufficient for you, you have another service called AWS Snowmobile. So Snowmobile is also designed for large scale data transfer, but it supports exabyte scale of data. AWS will provide the shipping container that will be delivered to your location. And AWS will be there to set up the connection to your network and then you load your data into the Snowmobile, which is a container. Then AWS will load this data back into S3 when the container is received at their location. And so if one trip is not sufficient, they will do multiple trips to get those data. Next, we'll talk about another service called AWS S3 Transfer Acceleration. So Amazon S3 Transfer Acceleration, it enables fast, easy, and secure transfer of files over long distances between your client and an S3 bucket. This transfer acceleration, it utilizes the CloudFront Edge Network to accelerate the upload to S3. So if you remember from my earlier tutorial, CloudFront is an content delivery service which leverages the edge locations within the global AWS infrastructure. So instead of directly uploading the file to S3 bucket, you will get a distinct URL that you will upload the data to the nearest edge location. And the edge location will then send file to the S3 bucket. So transfer acceleration takes advantage of the Amazon's CloudFront's globally distributed edge locations and it can speed up content transfer to and from the Amazon S3 by as much as 50 to 500 percent for long distance transfer. So this is it on AWS storage services. If you like my contents in my YouTube channel, do like, share, subscribe and recommend to your friends and do check out my other contents which are specifically designed for beginners and those who wants to get the certification. So do check out my further videos as well. Thank you.